I'm so, I'm so glad that we're in God's house today. Do you know what this day is? Today is No Excuse Sunday. So on No Excuse Sunday, we encourage both the faithful and the unfaithful to attend the church this year. Next Sunday and every Sunday from now on is going to be No Excuse Sunday. Let me tell you what we're offering you on No Excuse Sunday. There will be cots in the foyer for those who say Sunday is my only day to sleep in. There'll be marine, which will be available for those of you that have tired eyes because you stayed up way too long last night walking, watching television. There will be steel helmets for those who say the roof will cave in if I come to church. There'll be blankets that will be furnished for those of you that think the church is too cold. And, and, and there, there will be fans for those of you that think the church is too hot. We will be giving to you on No Excuse Sunday. We will be passing out and distributing hearing aids. For those of you that say that the minister speaks too softly and, and for for cotton, for those of you that say that the minister is far too loud. On No Excuse Sunday, we're actually going to pass out scorecards are going to be available for you so that you can list all the hypocrites that are present. <laughs> and on No Excuse Sunday, some relatives are going to be in attendance because some of you all just like to do, you're only visiting on Sunday. Also, for those of you that are hungry, on No Excuse Sunday, there will be TV dinners for those who can't go and, and, and go, uh, who can't go to church and, and cook dinner also. So we're going to give you some good TV dinners. <laughs> One section of the church is going to be devoted to trees. And the other section of the church is going to be uh, devoted to grass for those who love to seek nature. Finally, on No Excuse Sunday... The church will be decorated with both Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who have never seen it without them. Would you stand with me, please? I want to preach today on this No Excuse Sunday. I want to preach a message entitled True Biblical Growth Perverses Man-Made Manufactured Growth. Now, what I just said to you might seem a little sun, a little, a little, um, a little funny, but but we got multiple services. Sometimes, not just because we can't fit the people in the church, we want to make it convenient in the summer to have an early service so people can come in early and get out so that they can spend the rest of their day doing whatever they want to do. Then we have another service, a later service, for those that, that, that are the young adults and they, they, they stay up all night and, and, and they sleep in half the morning. My, we've got Bibles today for, for, for children, for youth, for, for military. I mean, we've got, we got a Bible for everybody that's alive and breathes. I mean, we've got churches by the tens of thousands that, 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 that are out there figuring how on earth they are educated, they are studied, and seminaries are turning out people that are professional in growing churches. Oh, how can we best get a crowd? I'm not looking for a crowd. I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking not for, for, for manufactured, man-made growth. I'm looking for true biblical growth. And we're going to explore that today in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Would you turn there, please? How can we see true biblical church growth? I want to say to you, there will be no excuse Sundays. <laughs> in case you're wondering, that was just something that I thought might get your attention. But isn't it so true? I mean, if the weather's right, we'll attend the house of God. But when was the last time you realized you are the house of God? That His Spirit dwells in you and I. But we need, I, I'm telling you, the closer we get to the imminent return of Jesus, people are going to fall off like flies. They're going to think that prayer is not important. They're going to think that the Word is important. They're going to think that fellowship is important. They're going to think that I, I don't need God's house. I don't need cover. I'm just on my own. Well, when you're on your own, you're easy to be picked off. And the enemy is picking off multiple thousands of Christians today who call themselves Christians but have never been reborn. 
or have and just wondered and, and said, no longer God, are you only number one? I want to I wanna back it up and we're going we're gonna to begin with verse 14 of chapter 12. But Peter, uh, chapter 2, excuse me, of Acts. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, this is after the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and all the people at Pentecost there in Jerusalem heard, heard their tongues in their own language, and the people that spoke it did not even know that language, but they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words, for those are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maidens, maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall, they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. The sun shall be turned into blood and, and the moon into uh, darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Say that with me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to, to, to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and you've crucified him, put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may be shaken may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Verse 27. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to seek corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has, has sworn with him an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ who sits on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. That Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out on which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were all cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? See, that's where God wants the church. That's where he wants the gospel message to bring people to the question, what shall we do? What shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now I submit to you, this is not the baptismal formula. and We'll explain it. Repent, therefore, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the, for the Spirit is to you and to your children and to all who are far off and as many as the Lord our God shall call. And here's the whole crux of it, the vital, vital church growth. How do you grow a church? How do, how do you grow a church? How do you in, impact 40,000 people here in Westfield and touch the ends of the earth? Certainly not manufactured man's way. 
but biblical growth. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who were glad to receive the word, the word, were baptized. And that day, about just a small crowd, 3,000 were added to the church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking bread, in prayer. Then what happened? Oh, great joy, and oh, you, you know, this is great. I love this church. It's everything I want. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now whole, all who were believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions of goods, and divided them among, among them all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You may be seated. True biblical church growth versus man-made, manufactured growth. And if you don't believe that exists, then don't be offended by what I'm going to say. You're an ostrich with a head in the sand. We see it today. There's seminars about it. It's church growth. And we need to grow church. But we need to grow through and by the power of the Holy Spirit based on the Word of God. See, lived out with God's people. Having an effect in a world that so desperately needs them. It, you've heard me say this. It's not about uh, ambiance. It's, it's not about what makes you feel good. And, and that's, that's what's happening. Churches are trying to do everything they can to attract people to make them feel good. Hey, listen, when I'm in church, I don't want to be comfortable. I want there to be a whole lot of shaking going on. Elvis Presley, if you please. I want, I want God to shake me from pillar to post. I don't want to just be comfort, sit, comfortable and sit back and yawn and fall asleep and snore and wake up when the, when the preacher says amen. God has got a work for us to do and He wants to grow His church and He wants to grow it in a true biblical way. It's not about even praise and worship styles. Although we might have our certain preferences, it's not about the lighting. And you've heard me say, it's not about the smoke. It's not about this or that. The Bible says, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. We just read Acts chapter 2, and 38 through 47. And, and the startled multitude gathered in the streets. They, Jesus said, postpone everything. I'm about uh, ready to ascend and transcend to glory, but I want to make sure that the church isn't left powerless. I'm going to undo that church, not with the ways of the world, but I'm going to undo that church with the third person of the Holy Trinity. I'm going to unctionize that church that they will be irresistible. I'm going to pour out new wine and new oil. The kind that restores the soul. It's not going to be religion. Religion is man reaching out to God. Christianity is God reaching out to man. I've had my fill of church and I'm a pastor and you look at me like I'm crazy. I don't just need another church service. I need the moving of the Holy Ghost to stir me from pillar to post to get me out of my mediocrity so that I can be on fire for God and to be a true biblical individual and be a part of a church that is biblical and transparent and reaching people they were startled the multitude gathered in the streets outside the 120 christians had been baptized in the holy ghost and make no mistake about it it was a difference it wasn't just talking in tongues it's not how high you jump it's how straight you walk when you hit the floor baby it's not just holy ghost doodads making you feel good the whole the holy spirit is not someone that you play with He's an entity. He's a person. He has a personality. They were proclaiming the wonderful works of God because they'd just been infused with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and they, were, they were being used to speak out the languages of the land. Many that had assembled there were Jews and they, and they were from distant ways, but they were still there living in the area. The people of Jerusalem thought that they, they were rid of Jesus. Now, these Spirit-filled Christians... One of which Peter, who denied the Lord, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. 
But, but thank God it wasn't apologetics. Thank God that, that, that the apologetics is important. What we know about Scripture. But, but it wasn't just an apology that Peter gave Jesus. He realized. He wept when that rooster crowed. He knew that he had denied the Lord. And you listen to me, holy and sanctimonious individual. There's not one of us here today has not failed Jesus. B.C. before Christ and even knowing Him as our Savior. We're here by the grace and the mercy of God. I've come to town to preach today. We're here by the grace and mercy of God. And listen, we're the only ones He's got. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're it. It's the ecclesia. It's a church. Those who know Christ as their Savior. He doesn't have plan B. You and I are plan A. That's scary, isn't it? Now, my son-in-law preached, and we've been preaching on the power of the Holy Spirit. Why would we not want, with the mighty Yeshua, Jehovah, El Shaddai, the one who is, whose power is so powerful that death couldn't hold him. And he has at our disposal the power, the mighty power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the mighty power of walking in the Spirit and being overcomers rather than circumers. Why would we not want all of the Spirit of God that He has for us? Why is it that we come Sunday to Sunday with pitchfork and shovel and we shovel over what we don't need to somebody else that we think needs it more than us? Or, get it this way, oh, I wish that person was there. They're the ones that really needed it and they weren't there this Sunday. Well, you're here today and I'm here and I need it. We need to understand the biblical formula of growth and not man-made growth. I... I I have been in the past, but I confess to you today, I'm not interested in a crowd. I'm interested in Jesus. Because when you lift him up, he'll draw people to himself. Church growth. There are a lot of books on it. There are a lot of seminars on it, but very few on church health. How about church health? Regardless of your size, how healthy are you? How healthy are you as a church? And I'm telling you, there are unhealthy churches that are drawing crowds, but they're, but they're doing it in a way of compromising the Word of God. And I refuse to do that. If we have three, well, hallelujah. If we have 3,000 three, hallelujah. My hallelujah is not going to increase. So what caused this bunch of ruffians, 120 disciples that had been infused with the power of the Holy Spirit and had this life-changing experience? You see, not everyone understood what happened to them. Peter spoke for the rest of them. <laughs> Impetuous Peter. <laughs> oh, he put, he put his foot in his mouth all the time. We never do that. I've never done that as a pastor. At least I've lost count, actually. But I want you to look at verses 14 to 21. We just read about it. He said, the third hour of the day, nine in the morning, that's too early for people to get drunk. And there's never an appropriate time, let me say that, for people to get drunk. He said, your sons and your daughters, your young men and your old men servant, the gift of the Holy Spirit, listen to me, is without distinction. The gift of the Holy Spirit is not prejudice. It's not according to a person's religious rigors. You see, and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is without distinction, sex, age, or rank. You see, what's going to grow a church? The Word of God. You say, well, I already knew that. Well, I want to tell you, happy are we if we apply it. There are churches today that are compromising the Word of God to get a crowd. I don't want that to happen. Come on, shake your head. Yes, if you know that that's happening today. I mean, we've seen big praise churches fall on their faces. We've seen this and that. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here unless we preach the centrality of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. You and I, our preaching is in vain and it will do nothing. This learning center that God has birthed has been birthed by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God will give, will give favor and we will see, not a school, we will see a movement of kids. I want the kids back. Why do we get them out of Egypt and give 
and give in Egypt all the time with them all week long. Tell them, uh, little kids, that maybe you want to change your identity. A sex, give me a break. Sex education in the schools will make many of you and I blush. Why? Why, Pastor Wayne, are you starting a learning center? Because, because through fasting and prayer, when we had the beginning of the year, Gail and I and many of you said, God, what do you have next for New Life Christian Center? We don't want to just start ministries back up to start them back up. God, not my way, your way. What do you want, Lord? And out of nowhere, this was dropped into our lap. And we're going to run with it. And we're going to see it come to fruition. And we're going to have kids that are saved. And we're going to have kids that aren't saved. And we're going to start our day. We're going to start our day in prayer, in Bible reading, and saluting the American flag. What a novel thought. I didn't even have any of those in my notes. But anyway, they preach the word. Scriptural experience. What is going to grow a church as opposed to a counterfeit church? Listen, church, whatever experience we have, listen to me. It needs to be scriptural. Whatever experience you have in the Lord needs to be based on the Word of God. Can I get an amen? It needs to be based on God's Word. Simple understanding. They were, there was a seminary, and the seminarians uh, were in this particular seminary, and it didn't have, it didn't have a gymnasium. So, so the seminarians would play basketball at a nearby public school, and the janitor, an old black man with white hair, would sit patiently waiting for these seminarians to finish playing basketball so he could clean up. And he was reading the Bible. So one day, it intrigued one of the seminarians so greatly that, that he went up to him and he said, what are you reading? The man didn't simply say, I'm reading the Bible. He said, I'm reading the book of Revelation. With a bit of shock and surprise, the, 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 the person, the seminarian said to him, do, do you understand it? Oh, yes, the man replied, I understand it. Well, what does it mean? Very quietly, this black, gray-haired janitor said, it means that Jesus is going to win. Amen. Jesus is going to win. I read the last chapter of the book, we win. But we're only going to base that by the Word of God. Is there anybody besides your pastor that every time you read the Word of God, it seems like there's some new, something there that's fresh, that God takes the Logos and He takes a rhema word, a special personal word. I pray that be the word today for this church. Because I believe we're heading in the right direction, but we've got to stay on the straight and narrow. We can't compromise the Word of God just to get a crowd. Listen to me. God's Word. How are we going to ever know that in the end we win unless we read it? And study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be shamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Peter answered the charge of drunkenness because usually what the world supposes about God's work is false and misleading. Right? I mean, that's what the world says. Yeah, you're just going to this church. They're brainwashing you. All they want is your money. By the way, uh, the tithes have been down. Thank you for your faithfulness. And if you haven't been faithful, could you be faithful? No amen for that. that. I just had to get that in there. God provides, amen. Everything you and I have is provided by God. I mean, we had a flood. Little did we know the flood. We we're going to get, you know, finally we we're going to get some insurance money. The insurance money is going to take care of some of the things we're doing around here. But we could beautify the church until it's the most beautiful church on the face of this earth. But if it doesn't have the presence and power of God and it doesn't resemble Jesus, it's not worth anything. It truly isn't. True biblical growth compared to man-made growth. See, what the world supposes of the church. And that's where the church is in error. We're trying to find out. We're taking all kinds of stats and we're taking all kinds of, 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 of surveys on, 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 on how we're going to be able to get them to come in. And many of that is not based on the Word of God. 
some today don't understand and appreciate the Pentecostal experience. Uh, and our explanation isn't always going to, uh, isn't always going to be something that's going to uh, cause them to have the vali validity with that experience. But you know what's going to make the difference? The change in us. The things we used to do, we don't do anymore. I still believe in holiness. I said, I still believe in holiness. I said, I still believe in holiness without which no man's going to be able to see the Lord. Hallelujah. Righteousness. Walking uprightly. I can't do this in and of myself. If you've fallen, get back up. Don't stay down. If the enemy keeps getting you with the same things he's getting you with all the time, get in the Word of God and study. Hallelujah. You see, the onlookers at Pentecost were impressed with a, with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Say, they were impressed with what they had received. And I wonder, is the world impressed with what we have? Or are they saying to us, I could take it or leave it? You're no different than we are. I said, you're no different than we are. I want to be. I truly want to be. I want to be in the world, but not of the world. I want to care about people. But I, but I don't want to compromise to try to win them. I mean, the, the young girl at the, <laughs> at the Dunkin' Donut drive through I'd been sick for a week and a half, and Gail's been sick, and obviously you know, going out to get coffee was not on my agenda. And I saw her peek out the window and look at the next truck, which was mine. And when I pulled up, basically she said, where have you been? I've been missing you. What's that about? All it's about is, is saying to you, you are beautiful. Your smile is beautiful. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. You're doing an excellent job. And God has made a connection just with something that simple. And I pray what she sees in me. I pray that what she sees in my eyes. And when I go there and I'm polite with her and I pick up my coffee, I pray that she sees Jesus. Sees Jesus. See, the Holy Spirit never works apart from or contrary to the Word of God. The Holy Spirit never works apart or contrary to the Word of God. <sighs> the promise had suddenly become a great reality. What, what about the last days? What are the last days? The last days designate the period between Jesus' ascension and His return. Can I tell you that the next great cataclysmic event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church? Whether you're ready or, or whether I'm ready or the church is ready, Jesus is going to cause the dead in Christ to rise first. We which are alive or remain shall be caught up in the clouds of glory, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. If you think this world is a mess now, how about millions of people being evacuated and all the craziness of aliens, aliens coming and accosting us and all this and that? After all that blows over. And someone can't get a hold of their mama. They can't get a hold of their papa. They can't get a hold of their son. And they can't get a hold of their daughter. And you come to this church and the pastor prays God by the grace of God. And everyone here is not here. What a cataclysmic event that's going to be. Hallelujah. But people are not going to know that unless the word. And listen, we're going to start studying the book of Daniel this coming Wednesday at 6.30. We're, going, we're not going to exhaust the book of Daniel, but prophecy is, 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 is projecting what, what's going to transpire, and, and, and Jesus is coming soon. Pretty soon he's going to say, I'm fed up with this mess. I'm even fed up with what people call my church that are compromising and not even preaching and teaching my word. I'm sick of that. I'm going to vomit them out of my mouth. And you see, the Holy Spirit had come to bring men to the knowledge of Jesus. The 120 who had received the Spirit at Pentecost, they did not constitute all flesh. What does the Bible say? I will pour out my Spirit upon, say it with me, all flesh. Salvation is for all. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We need to be preaching that. It's, it's not about, there's not many ways. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by and through Jesus Christ the Lord. It's not Bahalula. It's not Muhammad. It's not Confucius. It's not, it's not Hare Krishna. It's Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. 
He wants everyone to be saved. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for selfish enjoyment. I feel good. It's not about feeling good. If some of you were sleeping, I hope that woke you up. Let me try. No. And I want you, I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit isn't just to make us feel good. It's, and the Holy Spirit is not someone you play around with. Listen to me. Too many churches are playing around with the Holy Ghost. You can't play around with the Holy Spirit. You're playing with fire. The Holy Spirit gives us power for witnessing. We're talking about the true biblical church growth as opposed to man-made, manufactured growth. Let's look at verses 22 to 36 in the second chapter of, of Acts. Christ is exalted. How are we going to grow? We exalt Jesus. Too many pastors are being exalted today. Too many worship teams are being exalted today. Too many ministries are being exalted. Some of you will get bent out of shape if you can't go to a concert. Have your own! I'm not against going to concerts. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But is your life dependent upon listening to that certain preacher? Or that certain singer? Or is our life dependent? I say to you, my life's dependent upon Jesus. I guess what? We missed last week, Gail and I. That's because we're not king and queen of this place. My son-in-law stood behind a sacred desk and preached the uncompromising word of the Lord. Guess what? If God called us out of this place tomorrow, it would still go forward. And if you stop coming, that tells me that you are only coming for Pastor Wayne and Gail. Oh, Father. I want true biblical growth. Is there anybody with me? Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. I mean, if you don't, then you're in the wrong church. That, that's all. I love you. Jesus' ministry was accredited by miracles, by signs, and by wonders. All heard of his, his miracles and his healing and, and, and the deliverance of the demonic. And, and, and the raising of the dead and the thousands that were fed by a mere morsel of bread and a few little fish. These mighty works were done not in secret, but out amongst people in public. And I proclaim in these last days, that's truly what God wants. I believe there are going to be more miracles take place outside the church than inside the church. Why? Because you're salt and light. You can lead people to Jesus I could never lead because I got REV before my name and as soon as they find out I'm a preacher, they're going to they're gonna check out. You and I, you're salt. You can win people and reach people I could never reach. I can reach people you can never reach, but together we can reach them. But we got to make sure we stay on course. That, we're, that we're, really, we're really looking for true biblical church growth. Peter's audience and his, and his world, uh, they, they could not plead ignorance. And listen to me. There's not one human being in this world that can plead ignorance. You can take a, a tribe in the far recesses of the world, and, and if they've never had a gospel or never had a Bible given to them. Romans tells me that God reveals himself through nature. We are without excuse. Some of us have more Bibles than we know what to do with. You got Hebrew, you got Greek, you got Latin, you got, I mean we and there's nothing wrong with that. Listen to me. But he says he talks about the, the, the victorious overcoming of death through Jesus. He said, Yes, they killed Jesus. But in God's foreknowledge included the death of his son, and not only the death of his son, but the rising of his son. And oh, when they put him in a grave, I could hear the footprints of hell walking the corridors of hell. And they took the keys, and they took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And Jesus arose. And do you know that those that were there in the grave arose with him? Can you remember Jesus when they tried to accost him in the Garden of Gethsemane? That that that, that because of his power, they drew back and fell down. They couldn't even stand in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus is just looking for a church that he can envelop. That he can work through. Amen. You say, Pastor, you're crazy. I am. I'm crazy, crazy, crazy about Jesus. 
and not wanting to get sidetracked. His ascension, His exaltation by the right hand of God exalted from the cross to the right hand of God. This is the story of our Savior. In Revelation 3, 21, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I have overcome and sit down with my Father on his throne. And after he was, he was raised from the dead, he ascended. Hallelujah. And he sits down at the right hand of the Father. So Peter's audience now, see this little shy, impetuous Peter that got himself in a mess. Now he's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's filled with the power of God. So Peter's, Peter's audience now heard that the, that the one they rejected a few weeks earlier was at God's right hand. Hundreds had seen him. Over 500 had seen him and, and his resurrection, and, the, and the, the eyes saw him rise from the Mount of Olives and disappear in the clouds of glory to heaven. Prior to that, they saw him, the people on the road to Emmaus. Then what's he do? He has the audacity to say, Listen, I'm not interested in all your factual things about your church growth here on earth, it's not man's way. I breathed on you the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said, you do not have to be comfortless. You do not have to be powerless. You can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what's happened in some of our churches? And I don't want that to happen here. We've got, we've got some slick willies and slick williettes that we can just do church all by ourselves. We've got the targer by the tail, baby. But the targer's going to bite us. And it already has. And people are settling, settling for compromise. And we're saying it. He said, Pastor, you shouldn't preach like this. Somebody has to preach like this. So he betoes the he outpours the Holy Spirit. The people soon receive the answer to their question. What does it mean? I mean, I want people to come to our church and I want them to be, I want them to feel that we're friendly, that we're not, we're not speckled nose, that we got our head up in the, up in the ceiling, or, or we think we're better than someone, or we're the mutual admiration society. I don't want that. But I also want people to feel, feel, feel welcome, but I also want them to feel uncomfortable if they don't know Jesus as their Savior. I also want myself and you all for us to feel uncomfortable. We've got sin in our life and we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to take care of it. I, I don't want to feel good about that. I want to feel convicted. And God loves us so much that He says to us, there's a thousand foot precipice and the bridge is out and I'm the bridge over troubled water. And there are not many ways. I am the way. So stop trying to compromise just to grow a church. Stay with the Word. Stay with the Word. So Jesus fulfills the Father's promise. By what does this mean? By outpouring the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. This is important. This which you now see and hear referred to the outward evidence of the Spirit's coming which the multitude was witnessing in the disciples' life. I've got to ask you a question. I've got to ask myself a question. What do people see when they see Wayne Hart's growth? What do people see when they see you? What do people see when they come to this church? Do they see a caring bunch of people that love God and love one another? And sick and tired of being sick and tired of all the nonsense that's going on in government and everywhere else. I pray they all turn on one another. I pray that they come to know Jesus before they spend eternity in hell. It's a promise. What was the promise? What do we do? Here's the word. You don't hear a lot about it. It's not going to grow a church. Well, Pastor, you're not going to grow a church this way. Preach on repentance. It might not grow a big crowd, but it'll please the Father. You're not going to get saved just by coming and repeating a prayer after somebody. I mean, if you don't know English and you need somebody to help you along in your prayer, that's okay. But what is prayer? It comes right from the heart, baby. Father, I'm sorry. You know what repentance is? Repentance isn't, isn't sorry that you got your hand caught in the cookie jar or whatever else it was that sin that you and I were in. Well, not the cookies are sin, but if mama tells you not to eat them, then maybe it is. It's not because of that. It's true remorsefulness for our sin that separated us from God. So Peter cries like John and Jesus. To repent means to, to make a, 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 a complete 
opposite turn toward God and against sin and self and others. He said, God, I'm coming to you. Now, I want to ask you a question, and I'm almost done here. But why did Jesus tell the people here to be baptized in the name of Jesus and not the, act, uh, not the Matthew 28 formula, which is the true, the true water baptismal foyer formula in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, accepting Jesus was a joyful experience for the people. And you know what breaks my heart? And I'm with you sometimes. I lose my joy. There are a lot of unhealthy Christians today because they've lost their joy. They've lost their strength. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm not talking happiness. Happiness is trite and trivial. But joy is fulfilling. Hallelujah. And they weren't looking at the whims of whether they could choose or, or, or not choose water baptism. It was an ordinance of the church. It doesn't save us. Water can't save you. To put water above the blood of Jesus Christ is wrong. Thief on the cross didn't have a chance to get yanked off and put in some water. Jesus said, he said, what shall I do? And repent. He said, this day I remember you in paradise. Water baptism is important. It's not a, a pick and choose. There's only two ordinances of the church, holy communion and water baptism. It's a vital part of our response to the gospel. So when Peter instructed them, listen to me, emphasis here, Peter instructed them that to be baptized in the name of Jesus. This was, was not to identify the baptism formula of Matthew chapter 28 to them. Either was it later when he talked to Cornelius in the household of Cornelius in, in Acts 10, 48 and says, be baptized in the name of Jesus. The reference in Acts to believers was being baptized in the name of Jesus as to distinguish Christian baptism. For, for, for some were baptized by John and others. You see, that, 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 that's the thing here. This meant following Him in water baptism. It, it, meant, it meant, Peter said, by, by an outward sign to the world that they are now Christians. This meant following Him in water baptism. John had baptized many people, including the disciples that Paul found in Ephesus. What did he do? After instructing them and teaching them the right way, what did he do? He rebaptized them. That's, that's what he did. And this was an outward witness that they had done more than repent or look forward to the Messiah's coming. That they had truly accepted Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. And then they, they were baptized. Their baptismal formula is in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will not baptize anyone that hasn't accepted Jesus as their Savior. And are doing their best to follow the Lord. We do not believe in sinless perfection. Well, you know, every one of us fall, and, but we need to repent of that, and we need to get back up. But listen to me, it's like communion. If you're born again and you fall, you come to the communion table and you feel icky and you feel like you're dirty. Well, repent of that. Forsake it. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, the Bible says if you're not a Christian, don't partake of communion. If you're not a Christian, don't be dunked under water because it's not going to make any difference if you don't understand and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior. He said, well, pastor, that, that's basic. God, help us to get back to true biblical growth. And then look at chapter 42, to, or verses 42 to 47. Believers united. So, pastor, how did the church grow? First of all, in verse 42, it says it grew up. And then it grew together in verse 44. Then it grew out in verse 47. And then in verse, 40, uh, verse 47 also, it says it grew in numbers. How did this happen? What, what's another true formula of, of church growth? Fellowship and worship. It's beyond me. I, I, when I lead worship, I don't try to look at anybody because sometimes it looks like I'm not going to wait for anybody to worship God. I'm not going to do it for a show. I'm going to worship Him in spirit. And do you know God is looking for new life to be a worshiping church? 
I'm not saying that you, you got to jump and you got to hoop and holler and do cartwheels. I prefer you don't do that. You're going to get hurt. But there's got to be a response. Come on, church. If Jesus has done something for you, the ten were healed of leprosy and only one came back to thank him. And he says, where are the nine? And I, I think he comes to church every Sunday morning because he's omnipresent. And he said, where are y'all? Where are you? Where are you? You're under your circumstances. You're under the road. Forget about it for a couple of moments and praise and worship me and see what will happen. Because if we lift him up, we'll be drawn on. Unto him. Hi, Jesus. I can't help it. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If I get a 10 point buck this winter, you're going to hear me all the way from Maine. Well, listen to me. If I wait for that, I'll starve. So in the meantime, I'm going to give thanks to God every day of my life. I'm not going to wait for the stars to line up, for the atmosphere to just get right. And I don't really much care who likes it or who doesn't like it. Matter of fact, I think we have some Muslim neighbors. I was on the deck last night going over this message. And I started to sing. <laughs> I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. You know the rest. The eye is, is on the sparrow. And his eye watches over me. It didn't bother me if the neighbor went back in his house. It didn't bother me. Because I wasn't praising him. And I wasn't doing it for him. Something just came over me and said, guess what? Last Sunday you were sick and you couldn't get to the house of the Lord. You're going to go be with your kinfolk tomorrow. So listen, son, you better get your gluteus maximus in gear because I'm about to do something special. There's something about fellowship and gathering together in God's house. Well, I can make it by myself. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the pit of hell. What else were they good at? The Bible says they continued in community. They continued steadfastly. And one of the things that they continued in, you know what they continued in? Doctrine. Everything that we experience needs to match up with the Word of God. I have met some fruitcakes in Christianity and some fruit loops. I have. Crazier than crazy. Crazier than a bed bug. But I also found if you take those people and you love them, if they're willing to be taught, and they're humble and they're teachable and they're pliable, God will take something out of a mess. Because are we not all messes without Him? Oh, Father God, I'm not trying to make up for a week. So, so what, is, what is prayer? The Bible says they prayed. They didn't pray less, they prayed more. During the dark days of the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln would say, I've been driven again and again to my knees because I don't know where else to go. I am telling you, it is time for the church to get on its knees because there's no other place to go. This is a wicked world we're living in and a wicked regime that we're under. And the only thing that's going to counteract that is prayer. And then I think of this. I think of the power of prayer. A marble cutter with chisel and hammer in hand was changing a piece of stone into a statue. And looking on, a preacher said, I, I wish I could, I could deal such a blow to the people I preach to every Sunday. So the sculptor said, maybe you could, was his reply, if you worked as I do on my knees. You know what really thrilled my heart? We have prayer during the week, Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 1. Many of you work, some of you cannot make it. So this is not a ploy to heap judgment upon you, not one bit. But for me to come back from that knowing that it didn't stop because of Pastor Wayne, but they kept praying. That's true. That's biblical. That's God. Fellowship, worship, and they continued in prayer. And uh, you, know what, you know what happened? And this is what we need in our church so that we're going to have true biblical growth is this. 
they, they, had a, they had a sense of reverence among them after Pentecost. After they f were filled with the Holy Spirit, they had a new reverence. You know what we do? We meander into the house of God just like it's another building. I told you, there are times where I'll go by a piece of paper and God said, who do you think you are? Bend over and pick it up. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor or not. We're in this together, church. I'm almost done. Come on, smile. We're in this together. If it takes a village to raise a kid, then it takes, it takes a church to get the work done. Working together for the cause of Christ. It wasn't a cringing fear, but it was a wholesome fear. It was holiness. Paul came into our office this week, and he had joy and excitement on his face, and he says, you know, God's been dealing with me to teach our young people holiness. It matters how we live. And what else did they do? They met in homes. And they also met in the temple. And then, after all the true biblical following of the scriptures, they begin to grow in numbers. You know what the church has gotten messed up? We got the cart before the horse. Growth in numbers, the harvest had begun, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And growth took place because God and men were working together. We got to work together, church. Are you with me? We got to work together. We can't have division. Amen? We've got to have koinonia. We got to have fellowship. We gotta, we're kinfolk. Amen? We're part of the same family, the same team. We work through our difficulties in a biblical way. Churches have shut down because that did not happen. Because they had too many. i got to be careful today to be politically. Don't be offended. They had too many chiefs. <laughs> got all these sports clubs now. You can't. You got to change their names because it's offending somebody. My God, help us. You know how I got saved? I got offended. That preacher up there preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and I was shaken in my shoes knowing that I was in sin and on my way to hell. And I thank God for that. But he did it in love. Stand with me, would you? The Lord will not do everything for us and we could not do anything of any lasting value without him. When we work together with him, there's eternal results. For a time, listen to this. This is true in this, in this setting. For a time, the church enjoyed favor with the general populace. Trouble would come later. <laughs> Always know trouble's going to come sometime, right? But at this time, because they were cooperating in what the Word of God taught to be the true biblical church, God gave them favor. And He was giving them a little bit of peace before the fire fell. Father God, I just want to thank you for your word today, Lord. I want to thank you, God. I know these people had no choice. They're here, so they had to listen. But God, I pray that, Lord, we will not compromise true biblical church growth for man-made manufactured growth. Oh, what were the marks of the early church? The marks of the early church was this. It could be summed up with love for God and ministry to others. The early church, the early church gave priority to prayer, worship, and the word. And they were concerned about the needs of others. That's how to grow a church. With every head bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. Is there anyone here today and say, Pastor Wayne, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm religious, but I don't know that I really have had a relationship with the Lord, or maybe I have and I've, I've drifted away. But I, I want Jesus in my life this morning. I, I, want, I want him more than anything else. Just slip your hand up. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. I, I pray everyone's saved. I pray if the rapture takes place right now, there will not be one person here. Not one. Because listen to me. I, I know this. I know this to be true in my life. You can fool Pastor Wayne. You can fool most anybody. But we cannot fool God. Right? Father, I'm asking today that you will help New Life Christian Center to continue to implement these principles 
of true biblical church growth. Help us, Lord, not to look at the church across the tracks or downtown or some other place and say, well, wow, maybe, maybe we just, maybe we ought to do that. But God, help us to find our place on our faces, on our knees, crying out to you that we need you, Father. Father, I pray today as people understand these altars are open, if they want prayer, we will pray for anyone and everyone today. I pray for those who must go, that you'll go with them and be with them, and that your Holy Spirit will be there in a powerful way. And I pray for the next coming weeks, and maybe more than that, as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, ways in which you can empower your church to do what it needs to be done. God, I love you. I love these people. And I thank you that they are yours. And now, Lord, we know what we need to do. Lord, give us the strength to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.